Good evening, everyone. Lawheed scholars, colleagues, friends. Welcome to this, the second installment of this year's Lawheed College Lectures. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. My name is Lois Harder, and it is my distinct honor to welcome you in my role as principal of the PLLC to the fourth season of these lectures. As we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, traditional homes, home to First Nations and Métis people. Established in 2015, the Peter Lougheed Leadership College aims to equip U Alberta students with the knowledge, skills, and experiences that will enable them to lead in interdisciplinary contexts and prepare them to engage with diverse peoples and ideas, educating them to be outstanding leaders of the future. Are you hearing that, y'all? You got some work to do. <laughs> I actually think you're all very outstanding already, but you know, more outstanding. So our classes are supported by teaching fellows who are accomplished graduate students from across campus who receive outstanding teaching training and professional development as they work with Lougheed scholars in their forums. As part of our undergraduate certificate program, students take a course called Topics in Leadership. And this lecture series is an important component of that course, which is taught by my exemplary colleague, Dr. Rhonda Breukreutz, who hails from the Department of Human Ecology in the Faculty of Agriculture, Life, and Environmental Sciences. The purpose of this lecture series is to expose students and community members to provocative research and big ideas that will challenge their thinking and inspire positive action. And we are extremely grateful to Sing Crude Canada for their generous donation that makes this series possible. Now, before I formally introduce our speaker this evening, we do have a few announcements. First of all, we want to thank everyone who donated to the Campus Food Bank this evening. If uh, you did not bring a non-perishable food item, we do invite you to donate online. During the address tonight, we ask that you do not take any audio or video recordings and that you set your cell phones to stun. Um, this lecture will be recorded and available to the public on our website. Now, tonight's lecture will run until 6.45, so it will start with our lecture and then followed by a Q&A. When those two pieces are complete, we'll say goodnight to all of you and Ken Regan and the Lougheed Scholars will leave the lecture hall to reconvene in their forum classrooms for the second half of the class. Our next lecture is on diversity, delivered through Indigenous storytelling, and it will be held on Monday, November 19th. Drew Hayden-Taylor, award-winning playwright, author, columnist, filmmaker, and lecturer, will be our guest that evening. So, now let me introduce you to tonight's speaker, Mr. Ken Regan. Mr. Regan is an award-winning journalist and recently retired CEO of the CKUA Radio Network, Canada's oldest public broadcaster and most successful community-funded broadcaster. So those of you who are campus radio aficionados, you may, be, you may know or you may be interested to know that the UA in CKUA is indeed our very own University of Alberta. So the University of Alberta can claim the oldest public broadcaster in Canada, which I think is pretty interesting. So obviously the precursor to CJSR. So returning to, returning to the matter at hand, I got a bit diverted. Um, during 18 years at the helm of CKUA, Ken helped bring the radio station from the brink of bankruptcy in 1999. It was a very dark day for those of us who were around and attentive to now self-sufficiency and financial sustainability. In 2012, he successfully capped an eight-year effort to secure a new home for CKUA with development of a $20 million state-of-the-art broadcast facility at the gateway to Edmonton, uh, Edmonton's downtown arts district. CKUA receives approximately two-thirds of its funding from listeners, which is truly an amazing accomplishment. Um, if you are CKUA listeners, you'll know that the station just wrapped up its fall fundraiser, uh, which has a goal of $650,000 in just 10 days. I think they, they nearly got there, which is pretty impressive, right? It's people, you know, with not pots of dough who contribute what they can, and, and they manage to pull that off twice a year. So I think that's, that's a kind of an impressive testament to our support for the arts here. 
This on-air campaign <clears throat> is just one of Mr. Regan's impressive financial innovations. In addition to his work at CKUA, Ken served for six years on the University of Alberta Senate as a jurist for the Audiovisual Trust of Canada and on the Canadian Association of Journalists Ethics Committee. He is currently chair of the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta Arts Awards Board of Directors. He has been honored with the Western Canadian Music Alliance Legacy Award in 2017, the Syncrude Award for Excellence in Arts Management in 2016, a City of Edmonton Citation for Contributions to the Arts, and was twice nominated as the Ernst & Young Canada Entrepreneur of the Year. I am, as you might have gathered, a huge fan of CKUA myself. If you want to expand your musical horizons, maybe get a taste for a musical genre that you've been curious about but not exactly sure where to dive in, CKUA is an amazing resource. There really is nothing quite like it. But I will let Ken tell you all about that. His talk this evening is entitled, Decision Making in Leadership. Welcome, Ken Regan. Thank you very much, Lois. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to set my timer here because I'm actually going to try and stay on time for once if that's okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you all, but especially the students of uh, the Lougheed Leadership College. Um, the college's namesake, Peter Lougheed, is obviously a legend in this province, and I think elsewhere in Canada for many reasons, but particularly for his own leadership because he wasn't just a politician, he was a statesman, something of a rarity uh, these days, I would submit. And because he earned his status as statesman, I personally, and I think people generally, respected him, even if they disagreed with him. And that's a point I'm going to come back to a little later in the presentation. But he was most definitely a leader. So to be formally associated in any way with a teaching facility bearing his name is a genuine honor. And I'll be honest, uh, it's a little intimidating. <laughs> but here I am. So I've been asked to speak about leadership and decision making within the context of my time as CEO of the CKUA radio network, which was a period of about 18 years. And I've also found this task to be a bit daunting because leadership, as I'm sure the students in the program uh, here will attest, is a big subject. In fact, in about 2009, I asked uh, a friend of mine and a freelance radio producer, Don Hill, to develop a radio series for CKUA exploring the idea of leadership. It was called Inspiring Leadership, and it examined the concept of leadership from many different perspectives. It consisted of 20 half-hour programs, and while it was a terrific series, it barely scratched the surface of what leadership is about. If you're interested, you can still download the series from iTunes. Uh, I think it's under Leadership Development dash Inspiring Leadership. In any event, this evening, I do hope to impart some of what I've learned about leadership and some of the qualities that I believe are important to leaders from my time managing the CKUA radio network. In doing so tonight, I'm going to speak about the importance of empathy, collaboration and trust, communication, integrity, and lasting, lastly, something that I call the yes, but what if proposition. So, what is leadership? Is it this? This? Is it this? I didn't think so. <laughs> or maybe it's this. Or that. Whoop. Or this. Or 
Maybe it is this. Or this, or this. The fact is that for some people, somewhere, at some time, the answer to all of these questions is yes. All of these people were, or are, leaders in their own right, in their own time, place, and circumstance. And in fact, we, you, are all leaders. Because the common characteristics of leadership are authority and responsibility. And each of us embodies those characteristics to some degree. It may be in our family, in our workplace, our community, or in the greater world. It might simply be in your own life. But we are all leaders with the power to do things and the responsibility to manage at least our own life, if not some other aspect of life. But what differentiates one leader from another is this, how they exercise or apply whatever authority they have and how successful they are or not at carrying out their responsibilities. As Shakespeare wrote in Twelfth Night, Twelfth Night, announcers should learn to enunciate, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Shakespeare may not have been speaking specifically about leadership, but I think the lines are relevant to the discussion of what constitutes leadership. And you'll notice that even though that passage was written in 1602, Shakespeare did not say, some men are born great. And again, appreciating that greatness and leadership are not precisely interchangeable in the context of this discussion, it's worth considering. Because I think it's fair to say that some people seem like born leaders, some achieve leadership status, and some have leadership thrust upon them. But to reiterate, we are all leaders in our own way. I want to speak now about empathy as an important quality of leadership. Because when I came back to Alberta to manage CKUA in 1999, empathy was required. To really understand why, though, I think it's important to understand some of the history about CKUA and the context around the particular time when I did return to manage the station. Uh, as, uh, as Dr. Harder said, CKUA is a University of Alberta invention, and it's a great one at that. It was established by the Department of Extension on this campus at Pembina Hall, which I think you see in the picture there, uh, or there. In 1927, it is Canada's first educational broadcaster and Canada's first public broadcaster, predating the CBC by almost a decade. Its mission unlike the handful of private radio stations at the time, was not to make money. Rather, it was to use radio to serve the community by offering educational and cultural programming to everyone and anyone who had access to a radio. This differentiated CKUA from other broadcasters, and it also meant that throughout its history, as a public service broadcaster, CKUA tended to attract employees who, like CKUA, were mission-driven. People for whom working at CKUA was more of a vocation than a job. From its founding in 1927 until the mid-1990s, CKUA was funded either through university grants or Alberta government subsidy. By the 1980s, um, in large part due to the vision of Premier Lougheed, CKUA was part of the Alberta Educational Communications Corporation, or Access Network. And it had grown from a small, low-power AM-only station into the largest educational broadcasting service in Canada. It was one with a relatively small but a very loyal audience that appreciated CKUA's unique programming and the fact that it was an Alberta institution. 
All of this changed in 1994, when the government of Premier Ralph Klein, in the midst of a recession, and in its determination to balance budgets and reduce or eliminate Alberta's growing debt, began slashing government spending. On November 30th, 1994, it was announced that the entire access network, including CKUA, was an unnecessary expense and all assets would be sold or disposed of. Now, almost immediately, a public outcry erupted over the fate of Access TV, and even more concern was expressed about the potential fate of CKUA, for which there appeared to be no interested buyers. Now, additional evidence of CKUA's strength of community soon became apparent too, when a number of groups under the banner Friends of CKUA, with the less than subtle acronym FOC UA suddenly sprang up around Alberta to protest the government's proposals. Ignoring those early protests, though, the government proceeded. Access TV was sold to Moses Neimer of City TV fame. CKUA's senior management was terminated, and CKUA's assets, the transmitters, the studios, the equipment, were handed over to a Calgary shopping mall developer named Gail Hinchliffe. With the aid of about $5.5 million in transitional funding from the Klein government, Hinchliffe's job was to take CKUA from, from government-funded entity to self-sustaining private enterprise. But within two and a half years, virtually all of the money was spent. Some of it, as it turned out, on Hinchliffe's own board of directors and rented apartments and such things. And at midnight on March 20th, 1997, without warning to staff or the community, the locks on the doors at CKUA's offices were changed and CKUA was shut down. Hinchliffe claimed that CKUA was broke and there was no other choice. Obviously, the shutdown was a surprise to many, but the response from CKUA's audience and the greater Alberta community was equally surprising to Klein's government. Because what transpired in the weeks following the shutdown is unprecedented in Canadian broadcasting history. What had begun initially as small local expressions of frustration and anger continued to grow, and within a few weeks, those smoking embers of anger erupted into a full-blown prairie wildfire of outrage. Ralph Klein would later say that in the midst of the largest cost-cutting initiative in Alberta history, when schools and hospitals were being shut down, teachers and nurses and civil servants were being laid off by the thousands, nothing generated as much hate mail as the decision to shut down CKUA. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? What Klein was witnessing, though, though he may not have realized it at the time, was essentially a grassroots revolution. And soon, a group of revolutionary leaders emerged from Edmonton and Calgary. Led by internationally renowned jazz musician Tommy Banks, Edmonton Folk Festival producer Terry Wickham, supported by singer Jan Arden, and an Edmonton lawyer and Canadian Football League referee named Bud Steen, they formulated a strategy to force Hinchliffe and her board to resign and turn over all CKUA assets so that this new group could return CKUA to the airwaves. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Bud Steen in the audience here tonight, and hopefully after we're done, you might have an opportunity to talk to Bud, and uh, he can share some of his personal stories about that time in CKUA history, because to uh, say the least, it was uh, challenging. It took six weeks, six weeks of unrelenting public protest and threats of lawsuit against Hinchliffe and others within her group, but ultimately the new group prevailed. On May 2nd, 1997, six weeks, after six weeks of silence, CKUA went back on the air with a fundraising campaign hoping to raise $500,000 to help put the station, stabilize the station. Immediately, money began flowing in from across Alberta, across Canada, and from the United States and around the world. 
And when the fundraiser closed 10 days later, CKUA had raised more than $1 million. I recount all of this history because it's important to appreciate that what happened with the community rescue of CKUA in 1997 was not just unprecedented in Canadian broadcasting history. What transpired was that a grassroots revolution had been fought against a powerful premier and a governing party that had been in office for over 25 years, and the revolution had been won. But here's the thing about revolutions. Once they're over, and the victory's been celebrated, like any great party where maybe you drank too much, the hangover and the reality started to sink in. 18 months after the shutdown and the Phoenix-like relaunch of CKUA, which was now operated by the staff who had fought that revolution, CKUA was again in financial stress. Revenues were drying up, and sustaining income was proving very difficult. Worse, internal divisions had begun to develop over the direction of the station, as well as the style of leadership of the current station manager, who'd been hired by the same leadership group who just helped win the revolution. And in late 1998, the station manager resigned. The revolution was definitely over. This was the point at which I decided it was a good idea to leave a great job at Discovery Channel in Vancouver and come back to Edmonton in February to manage a failing radio station riddled with problems. <laughs> so, you know, you might justifiably at this juncture question my qualifications to give a lecture on leadership because clearly I'm not too bright. <laughs> but here's the thing. I loved CKUA. I had previously worked there for almost 13 years as a journalist before leaving, just before it was privatized, to work at CBC Television News. And all of that time that I was away, I had missed the revolution although I got to report on it while at CBC, but I had continued to follow CKUA's fortunes even after I'd moved to, over to Discovery Channel in Vancouver. And all of that time away, I realized that had it not been for CKUA, none of those other opportunities with the CBC and Discovery Channel would have come my way. And at first, my inclination when the job came open and some people contacted me and said, you have to apply for this job, you'll be great, whatever. My first inclination was, well, first of all, they can't afford me. And second of all, why would I give up this job in Vancouver and the lifestyle? And then I went from that to, well, you know, there's no way I would go back there unless I felt like I had something to offer them. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, well, you know, maybe I did have something to offer my experience. Uh, in, in other organizations as well as at CKUA told me that I knew something about the operation and, and I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe there are some things that I could tell them that would help. And when I reached that point in this epiphany, this evolving epiphany, if there is such a thing, when I reached that point of realizing that maybe I did have something to offer, that maybe I did have some, some way to help, I felt a profound responsibility because I asked myself the question, if you, if you can help, then why wouldn't you? So at the last minute, I applied for the job. They interviewed me. I made the short list. They brought me in for a second interview. And I was very candid with them. I remember Bud asking me in the, in the second interview session, if we were to hire you, what's the first thing you, you would do? And I said, well, sir, the first thing I would do would be to ask you to find me another $100,000 because you can't run the radio station on this budget. And I guess Bud and the others figured, well, if he thinks he's so smart, let's see if he can actually do this. So they hired me. 
But coming in, I had a pretty good sense of what CKUA's problems were. I reviewed the financial statements, and I had a reasonably good sense of the people working there because many of them were people I had previously worked with when I was part of the newsroom in the 1980s and 90s. So although CKUA was in dire straits financially, I felt that with some careful management and some luck, we could at least stabilize things and get it back on track. What I wasn't truly prepared for, though, was how polarized and how deep were the, the divisions were among staff. Because in the time between coming back on air, winning the revolution, coming back to life, and the time the former general manager resigned, the comrades of the revolution had split into two warring camps. There were those who supported the general manager of the day and those who did not, with the inevitable result that CKUA had devolved into complete and utter dysfunction. So in addition to dealing with the financial issues, I soon realized that I also had to deal with this internal split. Because even if we were able to increase revenues, CKUA was not going to survive the internal strife that it was facing. But this is where empathy comes into play. I know you're thinking, finally. <laughs> But I think you needed that context and that background to understand what I'm going to say next. Now, there are hundreds and perhaps thousands of books and business articles written about the importance and power of empathy. I have never read any of those things. But after arriving at CKUA, I knew instinctively that for most, if not all of its staff, the fight to save CKUA was not, not just a series of profound historical events. It wasn't about saving their jobs or their livelihoods. For them, it had been a battle for a genuine and noble cause. It had been their revolution, and they won it. So, to again be faced 18 months later with a struggle for survival without any external villain this time was for most of these people an incomprehensible stress. They were, I believe, to some degree at least, traumatized. But because I was able to empathize with them, I did the following. I invited every member of my staff, of the staff, into my office, one at a time, over a period of several weeks, just to talk. And in each instance, this is what I said. I said, I want you to tell me honestly how you feel. I want to know how you feel about this place, how you feel about me, how you feel about your role here, and how you feel about your colleagues. And I also said, nothing you say will prejudice me against you, and nothing you say will prejudice me against anyone that you may say it about. Now, I realized this was a bit of a risk because I knew that not everyone was happy about my being hired to replace someone they'd literally fought alongside during the revolution. But the results of that, I wouldn't call it an experiment, but the result of that process were interesting. Some people spoke for a few minutes. Some people went on for hours. Some people yelled. Some people cried. But what I saw in every, virtually every instance, as each of those people spoke, was an incredible burden being lifted. I could almost literally see the physical and psychological release. Just the opportunity to talk to someone who was ready to listen. And when each of them was finished, I said this. OK, now I'm going to ask something of you. When you leave this office, I'm going to ask you to commit to working with me and your colleagues, even those you may have grievances with, 
because I know you love this place. And it's the only way CKUA is going to make it. And I also said, if you can't commit to doing that, I'm going to ask you to resign. Because if you're not happy here, you won't be able to give CKUA your best. And more than that, after everything you've been through, you deserve to be happy. Empathy. My ability to meet each employee behind closed doors and let them vent, be angry with me or others, or to cry or yell, was simply because I empathized with them. And empathy is different from sympathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is understanding what it is that is causing them to grieve or to be angry. And it's not like I'm some, you know, genius. I was just fortunate enough to see the picture and understand it. And while providing them that opportunity to release their stress and anxiety didn't necessarily change CKUAs or even their situation in the short term, it did do this. It signaled to each of those people that I cared enough to hear them out. It suggested that I understood, at least to some degree, their frustrations and anger and pain. And because of the honesty of those exchanges, it allowed them to develop a sense of trust toward me. And that, that was a foundation that I knew we could build on together. So let's talk now about trust, or more specifically, collaborative spirit and trust as important qualities of leadership. Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, wrote, without trust, we don't truly collaborate. We merely coordinate, or at best, cooperate. It is trust that transforms a group of people into a team. Now, CKUA, like most broadcast entities, was, and I think still is, an in inherently collaborative workplace. And there are many reasons for that, some of them obvious. For one thing, collaboration is necessary because it's impossible for any one person or any leader to know everything about an organization or an operation. In my position, I did need some knowledge in a few things, like financial management, human resources management, broadcast regulations, elements of the law, logistics management, marketing and communication, strategic planning, broadcasting best practices, and communications trends and technologies. But Understanding every aspect or detail of an organization simply isn't possible. Which is why it's essential that good leaders are imbued with a collaborative spirit and that they surround themselves with knowledgeable people. Most well-run organizations make sure they hire people with expertise or specializations in one or more areas just for that purpose, to advise leadership on best practices or to bring ideas and knowledge of an organization's processes. As a leader, it's critical to know your own limitations and then hire or seek out people within or outside your organization who can help you fill the gaps in your own expertise. And there were many occasions during my time at CKUA, including just before I retired, when I would call up Bud Steen or I would call my colleague Brian Dunsmore or Katrina Ingram or Tommy Banks and ask for advice or counsel or Terry Wickham from the Edmonton Folk Festival. It's important to know your own weaknesses and gaps. So it's important to seek out that help. But in my role, my role at C as CEO at CKUA, I tried to make it a practice to not just surround myself with smart, hardworking, and knowledgeable people, Frankly, I tried as much as possible to surround myself with badass people. I wanted people who were not just smart, but who were also confident enough in their own abilities to challenge my ideas and question my decisions whenever they felt it was appropriate. Because 
what better way is there to test your ideas than to present them to colleagues or team members who will identify and challenge any weaknesses in your position? That's what collaboration is. However, as Covey says, trust is the secret ingredient to successful collaboration. So let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about here from CKUA. After completing CKUA's $20 million capital campaign and relocation to the Alberta Hotel in Edmonton, the second phase of our strategy was to raise mo the money and also relocate CKUA's Calgary operations to the new National Music Center, which was under construction in Calgary's East Village. The space we'd identified for CKUA within the NMC had a relatively small footprint of about 1,500 square feet, but it had 24-foot ceilings, which in my mind made it perfect for making the CKUA space a two-level, two-story configuration. To do that would require more money than we had at the moment, but I kept pushing my case for us to do the two-story construction and keep working at raising the money to pay for it. Now, several people within my team were challenging me on this, saying that we shouldn't take on additional debt, we were already carrying some from the first project, and that a two-story construct wouldn't necessarily add to operational efficiencies or functionality. But I was pretty adamant in making my case, because at least in my mind, I had a great vision of how beautiful the space would be with a main floor production and broadcast area and a second floor loft style area for administrative work. So in any event, after what seemed like weeks of discussion on the subject at our management meetings and constantly being challenged on my position, I finally, albeit reluctantly, relented and CKUA built the space with a single floor configuration and high open ceilings. And in November of 2016, we began programming from the King Eddy Hotel portion of the spectacular National Music Center in Calgary. But here's the kicker. Once construction was completed and I went into that space, I immediately realized that my team was right and I was wrong about how to do that build. Had my team simply nodded and agreed to my vision for the Calgary Studios, we would have had a very cramped, dark, and less functional space. My vision, though worthy, simply wasn't the best one for that space. And thank goodness, certain members of my team felt confident enough and trusted me enough to consistently and vigorously argue against me. Somewhere, I think, in the audience tonight is my colleague, Katrina Ingram, uh, who we first hired at CKUA as our marketing director, and then we later promoted to chief operations officer responsible for essentially all of the day-to-day -day management of CKUA operations. And Katrina and I love to argue. We, we had a great time. We were both interested in you know, big discussions and philosophical discussions about media and the broadcasting industry and the future of broadcasting in Canada and CKUA and all of those things. And, and on more practical things about things we were doing at CKUA. And I loved Katrina because she trusted me enough to challenge my thinking. And sometimes our discussions would, get, would become how you say, animated, <laughs> but the beautiful part of it was that at the end of the day, no matter how animated that discussion may have been, with both of us holding our ground tenaciously, at the end of the day, even if things had gotten a little off the rails, one or the other of us would go to the other person's office to check in and say simply, so are we good? And invariably, the other person would say, yeah, we're good. It's a great relationship that we had, but it was predicated on trust. So let's talk now about good communication and its importance in leadership. I don't think I need to say a lot on this topic because I think we all know how important communication is, whether it's in a workplace or within our own personal relationships. But I will say this, a couple of lessons that I learned in my work life and in my personal life are these when it comes to communication. Ambiguity 
equals trouble. And email is a great conduit for information, but it is a lousy communication tool. So let me give you a real life example that I think illustrates both of these points. And I'm going to have to give you some more background on this. In 2005, the CRTC, the Canadian Radio and Television Telecommunications Commission, which regulates broadcasting in Canada, was dealing with the arrival of satellite radio, Sirius and XM, in Canada. On behalf of CKUA, I'd gone to Ottawa to, uh, and made a presentation to the Commission advocating against bringing in heavily financed and leveraged American services into the Canadian market without some measure of control or at least concession to the Canadian-based industry. Now, at the time, I felt the introduction of U.S.-based satellite services represented a serious competitive threat to CKUA and other community-based Canadian radio stations, including campus radio. One thing I suggested to the Commission was that to help preserve the survivability and community of community-based broadcasters like CKUA, the Commission should consider the creation of a fund into which the new U.S.-based services would pay. That money could then be distributed through a transparent and equitable process and used to help the sustainability of non-competing Canadian services like CKUA. And following my presentation, I was approached by John Bitov, who at the time was the Canadian CEO of XM Satellite Radio. And he was interested in my idea. So, in, we didn't have time to talk right then, but in January 2005, I sent an email to my board to let them know that I was going to Toronto to meet with John to follow up what had been a very brief discussion on the subject. Now, my intention was simply to advance our discussion about the idea of new satellite services contributing to the idea of a community radio fund and to really gauge Bitov's interest. But to illustrate my point about ambiguity and the weakness of email as a tool for real communication, let me present the following, which is a transcription of an email between me and the chair of CKUA's board of directors at the time, my boss. It wasn't Bud, I'll say. <laughs> the names have been removed to protect the innocent. So, this is me writing to my board. Hi, everyone. Just to let you know, uh, I'll be out of office Wednesday and Thursday this week. I've arranged meetings in Toronto with John Bitov, uh, Canadian Satellite Radio, to follow up on discussion at CRTC around some of the outstanding issues around community radio funding. You know, I can be reached, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Brian will be acting as GM in my absence. Thank you. This is the chair's reply to my email. Hi, everybody. I have a few key questions for Ken. <laughs> That's an interesting opening, isn't it? Who called this meeting? Who's going to be there from CKUA, from Bitov's Consortium, from our ad hoc alliance of fellow interveners? When was the meeting decided? There was silence on this subject when we had a planning meeting on Thursday. <laughs> What materials have you prepared for this meeting? What data has been compiled? You appear prepared to pitch a position which the board has never received or formally debated or adopted, carrying our signal. The executive should see these documents. <laughs> There's more. And you can see here some of the questions that my chair, my boss, had for me. And there's more yet. <laughs> Now, I'm not necessarily the world's most perceptive individual, but based on the number of typos and grammatical errors alone in that email, I had the impression the response had been written in kind of a hurry. <laughs> and because I am somewhat perceptive, I also had the sneaking suspicion that the chair of my board was not especially pleased with me. So to my previous points, even though my board chair had written back in a pretty terse, you might even say nasty tone, or at least that was my impression, because with email it's sometimes hard to tell, but let's just say. In fact, she was probably justified to some degree, because my original email was clearly ambiguous, if I can use that contradiction in terms. 
I had made the mistake of assuming that because I knew what my intentions were with this meeting and because I knew it was not a decision-making meeting or any kind of commitment or deal-making venture, that my board knew that too. For me, the trip and the meeting were a relatively small element of what I thought would be a much longer process during which my board would be fully informed and engaged, but clearly my board chair did not see it that way. Now, had my board chair just called me <laughs> or met me to ask what was going on, we could have resolved the issue pretty quickly, I think, without the involvement of the entire board. Still, it's a good example of why ambiguity is bad and email is not always the best way to actually communicate something. So for all of you Lougheed Leadership College students, when you're making decisions, make sure everybody understands what's being said and what's required. And for God's sake, pick up the phone or talk to somebody face to face. Integrity. It may seem odd or even counterintuitive, but I don't think I need to say a lot about this other than to say that a genuine leader must have integrity. Integrity is one of the most important qualities any leader can possess, and to me, that's self-evident. Your personal integrity, your inherent desire to do the right thing, to be honest, compassionate, and decent, is fundamental to gaining the trust of your people, your community, and your peers. There's no substitute for it. Not just in your work life, but in life, period. Because if you do not have integrity, you will not have credibility. And without credibility, you will abdicate whatever authority you may have to lead. Now, of course, in having integrity doesn't mean you won't make mistakes or errors in judgment or that you won't be criticized for your decisions because sometimes there is no easy or simple solution to a problem. And as a leader, your decisions and your actions will impact people's lives. But if you do your job and act with integrity, you will know that despite whatever fallout might occur, you did what you did for the right reasons and you did the best you could. No matter what the outcome, your spirit and your integrity will remain intact. And if I may, while we're on the subject of integrity, I want to briefly say something about integrity in media. Because as somebody who's worked in print and radio and television news for over 35 years, I feel that I have some understanding of how it works. And I want to say that it troubles me greatly to see legitimate fact-based media being indiscriminately and unjustly attacked as so-called fake news while sycophantic propaganda machines are treated like legitimate news organs. So here's a fact. These are legitimate news sources, and there are many others. They may not be perfect, they may make mistakes, and sometimes some of their content might even show a little bias. But they are fact-based news sources that conduct verifiable journalism. And when they do make a mistake or cross an ethical line, they hold themselves accountable. Because their only currency, their entire enterprise, is based on credibility. Now this is also a facts, fact. This is not a legitimate news source. It carries images relating to news, but unlike the previous news organizations I showed you, this organization deliberately, not accidentally, deliberately twists information and distorts facts for the sole purpose of propping up a government, or worse, to vilify and demonize individuals and groups of people who might question or challenge the ideas of the government they support or simply because they're different. They play a dangerous game 
by abusing their authority and their responsibility to inform the public without even a semblance of integrity. There's another so-called news service that does exactly the same thing in another country. Attacks on legitimate media organizations are a great cause for concern because they feed the cynics who want to believe that all media are enemies of the people or fake. And over time, these attacks can confuse and frighten people and undermine the very meaning of truth. And if society loses its ability to distinguish truth from lies, we will have entered that surreal world described by the writer Franz Kafka. And make no mistake, free and independent media are essential. And they are a cornerstone of any democracy that ever existed, including our own. And I implore you to be mindful about the information you receive and to seek out verifiable media as your source of news and information, whether it's local, national, or international. And don't make the mistake of only seeking out sources or journalists you agree with. Seek out opposing views and opinions in order to better inform your own. There are plenty of legitimate so-called right-wing media outlets, just as there are legitimate left, so-called left-wing or centrist ones. But be mindful of the source you're accessing because it's important we are aware of these issues in media and it's important that we speak out to defend the legitimate media whether we agree with them or not and that we condemn the propagandists. If you're interested in a terrific online site where you can access really powerful and substantive news and information content from all parts of the political spectrum as well as a lot of intellectual and academic articles and great literature from all over the world, I recommend this site. It's called Arts and Letters Daily. So that was an aside and a bit of a rant, but I thank you for allowing me to exercise my <laughs> angst. <laughs> okay, the final thing I want to speak about this evening is the power of curiosity and the what-if factor. It's my belief the best leaders are innately curious. People who, no matter how good or how bad things might be, are always curious and willing to say, yeah, 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 but what if? Because I think a leader should always be questioning current process, current thinking, and current practices. Otherwise, how can you learn or innovate, change or improve? How do you go forward if you just accept the status quo and the idea that good enough is good enough? Moreover, to me, within the phrase, yes, but what if? There's an inherent enthusiasm and a sense of optimism that I think is important for leaders to maintain. I remember one time we were in a management meeting during one of our semi-annual fundraising campaigns that uh, Dr. Harder talked about earlier. The campaigns are extremely important to CKUA because more than 60% of CKUA's revenue comes from donated donations, and about 20% of that is raised during those two fundraising campaigns. So roughly $1.3, $1.5 million a year comes from those on-air on events. And this campaign, in this campaign, our fundraising was not going particularly well. And there was some angst and concern within the management group, and we were trying to figure out what to do about it. And in the course of the meeting, I said something along the lines of, uh, you know, I know things aren't looking great at the moment, but we've struggled before, which was true. And I think if we make some minor adjustments, we'll be OK. And one of my colleagues quipped, optimism is not a strategy, <laughs> which is also true. But the comment made me think of a story told about South African Archbishop and Nobel Prize winner Desmond Tutu, who is also, by the way, a non-doc recipient of this university. And I used his story to respond to my staff, and I think it underscores the idea about the importance of 
the what-if philosophy for leaders. The story goes like this. Following his announcement as winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984, Archbishop Tutu was often being interviewed by media from around the world. In one particular interview, a young journalist kept challenging his positive outlook about humanity and the state of the world. After all, Tutu had grown up during the worst of the apartheid years in South Africa and had been witness to much terrible human suffering. And at times, the young journalist was somewhat aggressive in challenging him. At one point, the journalist, with a slight air of exasperation, asked, why are you such an optimist? <laughs> Archbishop Tutu smiled and replied gently, my child, I am not an optimist. I am a prisoner of hope. And that's the thought I want to leave you with this evening. Whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter if you feel you carry the mantle of leadership or not, but especially if you do, be a prisoner of hope. You'll face many challenges. People will question your abilities. You'll make mistakes. And you'll wonder sometimes if you are on the right path or even up to the task. But if you allow yourself to be a prisoner of hope, it will lift you above whatever big or small challenges or negativity you may face to a place where you can see the road ahead. Because within hope is the spark of belief. And when you believe in something and yourself, even though the road at times is strewn with risks and cynics and problems, you will know that it does lead to a better place. It leads to the answer to that question you just asked. Yes, but what if? Thank you very much. It's been an honor. about issues of communication, trust, empathy, integrity, hope. These students have all um, had a bit of training on, on improvisation, where the line is yes and, ah. rather than yes but what if. So it's kind of related, mm -hmm. not yes mm -hmm. but, but yes and. So that's interesting too. So I'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. Do, do try to keep them brief. And I'm going to put on my glasses so I can see anybody who might ask one. Right here? Oh. Okay, so we'll go here and there. Can I go first? Yes, please. Yeah. Can you identify yourself? Hi. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm a first-year scholar at the PLC. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Reagan. Um, I just have a question in regards to uh, the idea of trust. So you were a part of a team who, at the moment, was experiencing some um, issues in regards to the workplace. And so my question would be, as future leaders, what tips or suggestions do you have in taking a group of individuals, using that trust, and combining their efforts into something that they might know will have a payout at the end of the road? It's um, a great question. And, you know, there are there are different ways you can approach that, I think. Um, you know, there are, and we, we went through some of these things at CKUA, there are, you know, team building exercises and things that you can do to try and develop uh, a, a team framework within an organization. And to be honest, um, they must work because they're used quite a lot in the corporate world. But I think what's most important when you're trying to develop that sense of trust and team within an organization where 
you know, I was fortunate coming back to CKUA in that I knew most of the people that I was working with and leading at the time because I'd worked with many of them previously. But you will often find yourself in a situation where you don't know anyone else on the team. You've just met them. But I think simple honesty. I think just being honest with one another and learning how you communicate with one another in a, in a respectful, genuine, and constructive way is the path to that idea of building a team and, and, and not just building them, but being able to lead them in a process or a project which is going to reward them. Uh, not, not necessarily even reward them financially, but in terms of ful fulfillment, feeling that they've succeeded at something. So, you know, as I say, there are, there are a lot of books and exercises that you can uh, resource to, to learn about team building exercises, but I just think approaching it from, you know, the, the, the basics, just simple, honest, truth, communication. Um, because, you know, we're all, we're all just, we're, you know, as trite as it sounds, we're all just, you know, beings occupying space on this planet. So I hope that's helpful. Mr. Regan, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name's Cliff Wilkinson, and I'm wondering, how does one go about encouraging integrity in the people you're managing, in the people you're leading? Mm. Also a great, a great question, yeah. Um, it's a, I don't, you know, it's such a, that's a, such a great question. I don't know that you can teach integrity, you know, uh, per se. Um, I think you can certainly encourage integrity and and reward it again, not through you know financial compensation, but just through acknowledging it and thanking uh, people. Uh, when I was at CKUA, I did a lot of thanking. <laughs> I, you know, we thank the donors and we thank the listeners and we thank the staff and we, you know, we thanked each other. Uh, and I, it, you know, it was just one of the things that, that I did. And I, it, it didn't, I, I didn't really think about it until I retired. And the woman who uh, had served uh, as my executive assistant uh, for about 10 years, uh, at, at my retirement, got up to make a little speech, and she said, the thing that I always appreciated was that every day when I left the office and you, meaning me, were still behind your desk, working and doing whatever you did, you do, you said, thank you, Susan, no matter what. And I think... I don't know that integrity can be taught. Certainly, I think it's important, it's critical that people in an organization, that the people you hire or the people that are working for you display integrity in the way they conduct themselves. Certainly on the job, I don't think you necessarily have any say what people do in their private life, although these days, uh, I think there's a, an, a, a much greater and, and appropriate appreciation for conducting yourself appropriately in your private life as well. So, you know, I don't think that it's anything that can be, can be taught, but I think you have, to, uh, you have to represent it yourself and hope that, uh, that through osmosis, if, if it's necessary, it, it goes through the organization. Again, thank you so much for the presentation, Mr. Reagan. Thank um, you. Other than 
other than in her integrity, what other qualities are important when looking for people to join your team? Uh, well, like I say, um, I, I looked for people who were really smart. <laughs> <laughs> and by that I and you, you know and by that I mean smarter than me I, I you know I had worked in the industry for a long time so I, I understood broadcasting and I understood radio and I understood journalism and all of that but to be honest I wasn't when I came back to CKUA I was not a particularly experienced business manager I think I'm I'm lucky to have good instincts and and reasonably good people skills um, but I needed people around me to not just to, you know, people that I could delegate things to, because when I came back, it was a, a small and really vertically oriented, uh, organization and we needed to flat, we needed to flatten out the, the uh, decision-making process within CKUA. So as I said in my speech, you know, I look for people that were hopefully smarter than me. Uh, who would challenge me uh, when my thinking, you know, was going, you know, off on a tangent or or wasn't making sense. And I was tremendously fortunate. Uh, and I had good, you know, I had good mentors like Bud Steen and Tommy Banks and, uh, and Brian Dunsmore, um, who's in the audience here tonight as well. Um, so in terms of qualities, yeah. Smart people and and hardworking people, you know. I I don't like being outworked by anybody. So you know, <laughs> sometimes it, it's got me into trouble because you know I might I tended to overdo it for for a time. But uh, those are the things I'm looking for: smart, hardworking, and committed, committed to the thing, committed to the place committed to the project, committed to the ideal of this thing. Not, you know, there were people, there were many people at CK Way who, you know, for whom it was kind of, it was a job. But the best people in an organization commit themselves to the, the place and the ideal. So I'm looking for that as well. Hey, Ken. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to um, thank you for your presentation. I'm Jason, and I'm currently a first-year PLC scholar in the 1F forum. Um, one thing you spoke about in your uh, presentation was using um, empathy and trust to um, rectify the polarization that was uh, present at C CKUA when mm -hmm. you first came to it. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that um, I think is pretty um, prominent in today's political climate, especially in the States, would obviously be polarization. Uh, my question for you would be, uh, do you think that this approach of empathy and trust can be used to help uh, rectify some of the polarization we see today? Uh, thank you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I haven't gotten to, you know, fixing the thing in the U.S. because I'm still working on that whole Middle East thing. But um, <laughs> you know, I think I think there is there is uh, an element of that that's missing in political discourse today. And you know, I've been around long enough to remember what the Canadian Parliament and even the Alberta Legislature used to sound like during question period. And there was always tremendous back and forth between the leaders and the parties um, on the floor of the House. And sometimes it would be pretty heated. But there's a reason why the parliamentary system in a democracy requires people who speak to refer to people on the other side as the honorable member or the honorable minister. It's meant to remind everybody that this is an honorable place and that we should deal honorably with the issues and with each other. To do that, 
you need empathy, and you need respect. And both of those things, uh, sadly, are in, um, are tremendously lacking in political discourse. I think particularly in the U.S. And I think you know, and I'm, and you know, I'm relatively apolitical, to be honest. I covered politics for many years, and I was the best friend and the worst enemy of every politician that I met. And that was good by me, because you know that's the way it should be when you're a journalist covering politics. But it made me relatively apolitical. But when I see what's happening in the U.S. and the leader of the most powerful nation in the world deliberately goes out of his way to make scapegoats of people who just want a better life. Yeah, they may, they may be you know, trying to get into the U.S., without filling out all the paperwork. But one iota of empathy in the man who leads that country would help him to understand that these people are not rapists, they're not gang members, they're not terrorists, they are people seeking a better life. And the least we can do is to offer them some opportunity instead of sending the army down to keep them at bay. So empathy and respect will have to come to play at some point. I don't know when it will happen. And sadly or unfortunately, it may require some even greater conflagration than what we're seeing in order for people to come to their senses. But I think it will. <laughs> being a prisoner of hope, you know? <laughs> I think it will come around. I hope it comes soon. Awesome. Candice, I have a question for you. First off, uh, thank you for your presentation. Sorry, where are we? Right, right, right here, right here. Right here. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty sure that uh, during your leadership career, you've had to have many, many uncomfortable and difficult conversations. Um, to this day, what makes you uncomfortable? Hmm. And how do you deal with that discomfort? Wow. <laughs> uh, you're right. I, there were uh, a number of uncomfortable conversations. I, I referenced in my speech about when I, when I came to CKUA and I had those conversations with people and I said, you know, I need you to commit to working with other people and working with me or, or I'm going to ask you to resign. And there were some people who did resign. And there were some people who chose not to. And for whatever reason, couldn't get beyond the bitterness that they had felt when things went bad. And, I, and unfortunately, I had to fire some of those people. That's never, an, a, never a comfortable thing, because as I, as I said before, as a leader, the decisions you make and the things you do affect people's lives. And there's, there's, you know, few things worse than having to fire someone or even lay somebody off, which I also had to do on occasion. So that still makes me uncomfortable. Uh, Sometimes, you know, and you know, here's another thing. I'm going to be very honest with you. I get really uncomfortable when. Uh, I'm having a discussion with someone and we're, you know, we're debating something that we need to do or a decision that we have to make. And, and you know, I talked about inviting people who challenge me on that stuff. And I get really uncomfortable when I realize in the middle of all of that, that as they're challenging me, I'm getting defensive. And it's a character flaw of mine that I work on, but sometimes in meetings, you know, you just feel passionately about something and someone says something to you and suddenly you feel like you're feeling defensive. And, you know, people who feel defensive tend to do two things. They tend to, you know, clam up or they tend to go on the attack. And uh, <laughs> there are, you know, there were occasions when I did both of those things. But, uh, but that really makes me feel uncomfortable because 
when I realize I'm doing that, I realize that I'm not doing my job. And I'm not exhibiting the kind of behavior that I am hoping others in the organization will exhibit. So that's a true confession for you. So we've run out of time. I'm very sorry. I think we could probably go on for at some length, but I really, really appreciate your candor and, you. and all of your fantastic insights tonight, Ken. It was, it was a pleasure having you. Thanks Thank so much. You.